practice. What do you look at in regards of, let's say, for instance, sleep? So what is the amount of time that they're off from one shift to another? Is that incorporated into this best practice or how does that exactly work? Well, I can't, um, I can't, I, I can't have access to their data. Okay. All I have is I have scientific data that shows me uh, what the quality of sleep is, what industries and what areas uh, that are uh, are short, what they call short sleepers, less than seven hours of sleep per night, and that all of it is. Jay, there's a ton of information stuck in the scientific community and stuck in scientific papers. And one of my jobs is to tease all that out and bring it down to an operational level. So that's where most of the statistics rely uh, are are lying right now, and they're not even. Uh, you're not going to find that in any OSHA regulation or the Bureau or BLS on fatigue. However, there are stats in the in the uh, in the research community about fatigue and stats and what the injury rate would be. You see, and, the, and that's interesting that you mentioned that because as I did research for our conversation, I started trying to pull up anything that I could find in regards of fatigue, sleep deprivation, and so on. And the only thing that I could really find that was talking about sleep deprivation per se was from the National Sleep Foundation. And then, of course, they give some some timelines on what they say, depending on your age bracket, on how many hours of sleep you should get. So, of course, when you start talking to about adults, they say that the average 18 to 64 year old should get about seven to nine hours of sleep. And then it said that if you're if you're older, between seven and eight. And so you start looking at that. And I know that you referenced the National Safety Council a couple of times, and they have a particular course where they're talking about defense of driving and on this defense of driving they talk about sleep debt and then they start saying if you don't get enough hours of sleep so let's use the seven and nine in particular here so let's say for instance last night you only slept six hours and you're supposed to normally on average sleep not seven to nine all of a sudden now you have a sleep deficit so as you they start going into the sleep deficit they start talking about now you're doing yourself as a disservice as a driver now it's talking there from a driver aspect so what exactly are you seeing in your research for instance the, the cdc does a lot NIOSH does a lot, uh, the Journal of Chronobiology does a lot, and there are other uh, uh, organizations out there that deal with fatigue and study for this. So, for instance, reading from a slide, CDC did a study in 2013-2014, and they looked at, at occupations. They looked at 180,000 employees. 180,000. That's, that's not a very small N, is it? Not at so, all. The, the point is, they looked at 180,000 employees, and what they did is, to, to make the data manageable, they categorized them using the uh, the occupational standards that the government use. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that. So they, they, they pushed them into those categories, and this is what they found. Uh, communication, comm equipment operators, 58% of them, whatever that group was, slept less than seven hours per night. Food preparation, 40%. Healthcare practitioners, 40%. Healthcare support, 40%. Uh, protective services, now we're talking about security, fire, police, emergency services, 39%. Production, 43%. The one that's most troublesome is transportation workers, which is 54%. Not only that, this study took a look at these 180,000 people, and they found out that between the ages of 30, 18, and 54, 40% of them were sleeping less than seven hours per night, which is the National Sleep Rec Foundation recommended number. And that number, so when, when, when you tell people about that number, they go, oh yeah, I've heard eight hours of sleep per night, but they have no idea what that means. The point is, the reason why the National Sleep Foundation does that is because it's all about quality and quantity. You need both. You need quality and you need quantity. Now, everybody has a different quality and quantity. And I can ask you, Jay, how many hours of sleep? And I, I ask this in class. How many hours of sleep do you need per night versus how many hours of sleep do you get? And usually what I find, it's about a two, three hour difference. Well, I probably I, I would have to probably factor that me personally probably need need probably somewhere around the eight hours a night. And I end up on average probably somewhere between three and four. Okay, and so and see, so now now you, you're talking. We're going to get to the complexity of all of this. That that is the problem. It's the complexity because you have a work life balance issue in tension with one another. So for for instance, for you, let's suppose let's not even talk about you. Let's talk about a, a theoretical person, person X, 
Okay. They're supposed to get eight hours of sleep per night, and they only get two. Over a five-day period, they are 10 hours in sleep debt. 10 hours. Most fatigue scientists say that if you are 10 hours in sleep debt, your mental capacity to do work is going to be diminished. You are in sleep debt. You are fatigued. Period. Doc. Have a nice day. And so a lot of people don't understand that. So now the question is, what generates that? What really generates that type of feeling? Well, there's a lot of contributing factors, and these things have to be teased out. So if you and I were in class together, I would I would show you this list that I'm going to mention to you, and then I have you prioritize them because I don't know what you can resolve or what you can reduce. So for instance, some of the contributing factors is anything that gives you stress, emotional, mental stress, or maybe you might have a medical condition. Or it might be self-induced. So, for instance, you're working a full-time job, but you want to get ahead of get ahead in life, and so you're doing a degree at night. That's self-induced. Work-induced. You're working more than、uh, than 10 hours a day, or you're working more than 50 hours a week. Or it's a lifestyle choice. I like to play in the band till one o'clock in the morning, or I like to play poker with the fellas, or I like to give charitable my time away to charitable organizations. And yet, I'm not sleeping well, or your sleep environment's not right, or you're taking medication that's not right, or preventing you from sleep. And all of these things can either work in isolation or in combination with one another to destroy, or limit, or reduce your sleep. And so, if we were in class, I'd ask you to take a look at these and start prioritizing because now you have an opportunity. To say, okay, what can I do, and what can I do, and what can I accomplish, and what I cannot accomplish, and that's the whole idea. And this is where this service becomes more personal. And I know that there are companies out there, Jay, that that have these fancy technological devices. Of, you know, you, you you plug in your sleep before you get to work, and they'll they'll you know you do it like a time card kind of thing, and they'll do that. But to me, it's not reaching the level to the managers. I mean, senior executives have the same problems as the person on the shop room floor. It doesn't matter. And so the point is, is that the technological thing is nice and it's shiny and it's new, but the idea is getting down to the person to try and change some lifestyle behaviors is difficult to do. But it's a needed kind of skill that needs to be put in place. So, Joe, if somebody's interested in trying to implement this, how would they go about doing it? I mean, how do they all of a sudden now go into their company and say, "Hey, we need to change our our issues with fatigue and sleep deprivation that we have with our particular employees"? How do, how would they actually implement a program as such? Well, the first thing I think is that first they have to recognize that it can be an issue in their industry or in their company. The second thing, and I've done too many of these things, is crawl, walk, run. The first thing that I, I would like for any safety person to do is take a look if they have the capability, and some of them don't, to do a data analysis on what they already have in regards. We got a timestamp on on a, on a, on a、uh, injury that happened, so take a look at their timestamps and see if you can't find a trend there. That may not provide you all the data you need. That it, it may not be the best data. The second thing is is that one one thing you can do is is have a survey of the employees that are there. And ask them these particular questions, and do it as a class, and have them write down on paper how much sleep they actually get, how much sleep they need, and and just put some of these stress factors down. They don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be、um, tied to them. We don't want them to be singled out because the last thing I want to have happen is to have this thing weaponized. I, I've seen things like this happen before, and that is the wrong path to take. So. Be that as it may, then you have to start collecting data. So it has to be part of your your、uh, accident investigation, your incident investigation type of things. How many hours of sleep did you have? And, and, and those are standard questions that need to be asked. Also, what can be also asked is the near miss system is also a, a wonderful place, and the、uh, correction and pre- preventative action area is also another area where you can collect information. And you're going to have to collect information, maybe for six months, maybe to a year, at that point in time. At the same time, you could be educating your employees on these particular issues of what is. And so, if you start collecting that data, you might find out exactly what's going on here, 
and, and then move from there. And also, what I would normally do right off the bat is, that as a, just as a courtesy, I have a scientifically validated program that takes a look at shift schedules. And so we plug in the, the, the days and the hours, and we look at over a 30-day period. And 30 days is more important than just one week because it shows you the trends of how much fatigue is available. And so what it does is fits out on the y-axis is the average probability of sleepiness that a person would experience. And everybody is different. So it would tell us, and I've done that for a few folks already, uh, but it hasn't shown any fruit, but I've done it for them. And some of them, I mean, I, there's one organization I'm thinking in particular that is above 50%. And... Uh, but they're working permanent nights, and permanent nights is the worst. It is the worst schedule you could ever be on. And they are over 50%, which means the opportunity to fall asleep is 50% right on the job. And it may be planned or it may be unplanned. So I know that sometimes they say that there are certain people that are able to sleep are able to sleep during the day, and some people can work nights because of that and so on. Do you really think that a person can adjust to that, or based on what you just said, not really? Okay, great question, Jay. Great, great question. Your physiology, and that's part of the class or part of the training, your physiology is set in stone. You're supposed to sleep at night and stay awake during the day. So there are, there are tools that you have, and I, I go over several tools that are practical types of things that you can, uh, that you can learn and understand how to get a better sleep. And what I'm trying to do is, is not um, modify, you cannot modify your physiology to, to break it the way you want it, but you can bend it and it can be bent. Uh, one of the things uh, is, is having a consistent sleep schedule. I mean, day in and day out. Uh, uh, sleep schedule in the sense of time for bed, time to wake up. Uh, also, uh, depending upon night, there are certain things you can do. But the list I have in front of me is, is I talk about practical coping strategies. It, it talks about alcohol, how you use caffeine, your diet, exercise. I'm in Colorado, so I talk about marijuana. I talk about napping as a strategy. I talk about nicotine, noise, good or bad, over-the-counter medicine, herbals, and then something called sleep hygiene and how you prepare your bed and yourself for sleep. And so those are the practical coping strategies that a person can employ to promote sleep. Or if they want to disrupt sleep, they can disrupt sleep as well. So talking about sleep disruption there for a moment, what is your feeling on these energy shots that people take to stay awake and potentially caffeine pills and so on? What is your thought process about that? I think I, I think uh, you Strategically, it's okay. I know that caffeine has half-life in the body, and I, I want I want to re- think it's about I think it's about three and a half hours, but I'm, I wouldn't quote me on that. But I, I would use it strategically. I, I'd rather use napping than I'd rather use caffeine, okay. and the reason why is because anything else is dependent. We, we, we as humans, we have a ten- tendency to be dependent on things. So, for instance. Uh, I could tell you that the number one go-to medication for sleep is Benadryl. And the problem with Benadryl, as would be with caffeine over a period of time, is you have to take greater doses and more frequently to get the desired result. And so I would caution somebody on using those energy drinks. Okay. Now, in a pinch, yes. Or taking a nap, yes. Or using Benadryl for sleep aid, yes but strategic use only, not as a lifestyle or a a developing habit pattern. Okay, so, and actually you referenced their nap, so I have a very odd question. I noticed as doing some of the research for this that they, I had pulled up a website and it was a place based in New York where they actually had, essentially they were like pods and they called them sleep pods. And you could actually go into a, a location, book it for X amount of time, take a nap, they come and wake you up, and then you can go back to work. Is that something that you would recommend? They also, I had also had seen a study a while back that they, they said that a lot of foreign countries do what they call siesta time. And it was something, it was something similar where you had um, an, allocate, an allocated t- amount of time during the day where you would take a nap at work. Is that something that you would recommend then? Uh, 
in my opinion, in my scientific opinion, am I doing it over?